So it, the South Africans, I saw a video of them dancing and celebrating. And I found that a little bit unseemly, frankly, when the people in Gaza were not happy about this ruling. It's not about the South Africans. It's not about us. It's not about activists here in the square. It's about the people there in Gaza, and they were not happy about it. So that's why I don't think it's a complete victory in any way. But it could have been a lot worse. So, And the fact that Israel usually gets away with this, and they haven't yet, is something significant. Absolutely. Joe Loria, editor-in-chief of Consortium News. Is that right? Yeah. So we are here at a peace rally uh, in a country of, I don't know, 20 million people. What's the turnout? 200? What do you think? Oh, what percentage is that? Uh, less, to, less than 1 percent. Look, uh, if two people turn up, that's good. So 10, 100 times 2. Think of it that way. No, I'm very pleased to see people coming out. Is every week? Is every Sunday you do that? They do this. This one, they do this uh, every month for almost a year already turnout is always kind of similar. Well, the reason that I start this short interview with you, and welcome in the Netherlands, <laughs> here, I was just explaining to you, this is our war monument. This is where we commemorate our fallen victims in World War II. Now, the Netherlands remembers war, but doesn't seem to remember the hardship and the pain and the suffering that comes with it. I'm disheartened that people don't turn up. Yeah, well, in the United States, has never, since the Civil War, which is a very long time ago, experienced fighting and dying on its own soil. Where here, as you say, less 80 years ago, which is why you have this monument. So there should be more of an understanding of what's happening when people elsewhere die, because there's an experience to remember by. Well, the Americans were cut off by two great oceans, and uh, it seems like a very far place away. And uh, we are closer to the Middle East here than Americans are. But the governments of the West are whatever the United States says. And it's, it's very disheartening that there's a lack of independent thinking. And it goes all the way down to Australia, where I was before I was in India and then came to Britain and now here on this trip. That whatever the Americans say is done and uh, that does not serve the interests of the West ultimately. I think that there have been great disasters for the United States in just the last three years. You think about the humiliating loss in Afghanistan which affects the American elites who are always worried about their prestige. You know, I think the rest of the world doesn't care about American prestige, but Americans do. And that was humiliating to, to crawl out of Afghanistan after 20 years there with NATO troops as well, wasting so many lives and uh, money for what? To, for the Taliban to take power again as they were when the U.S. first went there. And then we saw the Ukraine war instigated, provoked by the United States, backed by all the European countries, uh, has turned out to be a total disaster for Ukraine and for Europe. The European economy has suffered, not the Russian economy. They survived the sanctions, but they've hurt the European economy and killed so many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, many, many Russians as well. Uh, for what? To try to bring down the Russian government to weaken the Russian government, as the emissions of both the Defense Secretary and the United States President have been, has failed. And now Gaza, where the U.S. is backing a genocide, is complicit in a genocide that they could stop in one day by saying no more money, no more weapons, but they support it. And there's a trial going on in California, in the Northern California District of, of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York has sued Joe Biden, President, Lloyd Austin, the Defense Secretary, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, for complicity in genocide. And they actually had a hearing already. This is a crime that's being committed, and they're not winning that war either, by the way, Israel or the United States. So this is what needs to be understood, but the media is there to cover for the West, their own governments, not to bring the other side or the balance or the context that you need to understand what I've been just describing. So I'm glad there's 200 people here who do get it. So you just said that uh, you were staying in The Hague. Well, the International Court of Justice is in The Hague. So there's another uh, legal proceedings uh, taking place uh, around Gaza with South Africa winning, I think, uh, the case last Friday. What's your opinion on that then? Well, I don't know uh, about winning, but certainly they didn't lose. And I mean that the court could have, if they wanted, to dismiss this case immediately on procedural grounds that there was not a dispute a formal dispute between South. That's what the Israelis argued. They rejected that. The Israelis wanted it dismissed on the grounds that there was no evidence of uh, even plausibility well, of genocide. And they rejected that. Yes. 
And the, the world has been so accustomed to the ironclad impunity that Israel and the United States in international fora have enjoyed for decades that the idea that, that it wasn't dismissed is in a sense a victory uh, for justice. So the court could not ignore the overwhelming evidence that they presented in their judgment that 50 minutes that the American judge, Joan Donahue, read out. She referred very often to UN officials, the Secretary General, the head of UNRWA, and uh, the head of humanitarian agency of the UN, uh, in describing the indescribable suffering of the Gazan civilians right now, um, the amount of deaths of UN officials, the lack of humanitarian assistance. There was an Israeli lawyer on the previous Friday on January 12th who tried to tell the court that bottled water was being brought in and tons of food and there was more aid going in now than even before October 7, which nobody in the world believed. On the next Monday, that was Friday, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, went down to the briefing. I covered UN headquarters for 25 years in New York. So I know the building and everyone there. I know that press conference room. I was there every day. And you never see the Secretary General go there on a Monday morning in January. They give one, he gives one press conference a year in that room. Why did he go there? And he completely refuted everything the Israelis had said on Friday. He gave all the statistics about how little humanitarian aid was going in. So they were lying about that. The court accepted, they're a UN court obviously, accepted what UN officials said. And they went in great detail of the amount of suffering and death that's going on, the disease that's spreading, the lack of water. They really described what is a genocide. It was almost sound like the South African uh, complaint was being read by the judge. So they could, it was too much evidence not to rule that there was a plausible case and that they will put Israel on trial for genocide, which in itself is an astounding thing to hear. And this is how far Israel has gone. Now, I think there are loopholes in their judgment. I think it's one of these things where, as many court decisions are, that you could take whatever you want out of it. You could interpret it in different ways. They, for example, she did not say that they have to stop killing civilians or stop genocidal acts, but to prevent them from happening. To say stop them would to say that there were already genocidal acts happening. The court has not decided that yet. And they could, and the killing, stop killing of civilians has to be within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention to prevent genocide. So the Israeli lawyers could easily argue that, yes, civilians are dying. We regret that, and it's, but it's outside the scope of Article 2. You could even commit a war crime and be outside the scope of you could commit a war crime, but it's not genocide. So they could continue to find legal arguments why they could kill, why civilians could die. So it could have gone further. They could have ordered a suspension of the operation. Uh, but I think that that is not a victory for Israel. And it's not a complete victory for the people of Gaza because we, they are sorry, they are the ones who count. And they were very disappointed in this ruling on Friday. Were, were very you, disappointed. Were you disappointed? Well, at first, you know, my impression was yes, because they did not order a suspension of the hostilities. And my, what I felt, and I uh, reported that immediately, was then supported when I, in the analysis that I saw in Al Jazeera, and the reports coming from Gaza, and then a Reuters report from Gaza that I read, that the people there were crushed by this decision. So, it, the South Africans, I saw a video of them dancing and celebrating, and I found that a little bit unseemly, frankly, when the people in Gaza were not happy about this ruling. It's not about the South Africans. It's not about us. It's not about activists here in the square. It's about the people there in Gaza, and they were not happy about it. So that's why I don't think it's a complete victory in any way, but it could have been a lot worse. So, And the fact that Israel usually gets away with this, and they haven't yet, is something significant, absolutely. One wonders how much of the court case for the International Court of Justice was geopolitical from South Africa being part of BRICS and not just only focused on, uh, on Gaza, but time will tell. Well, I think that the courage that countries in the South now have uh, are exhibiting against the monolithic power of the United States in the world, to challenge the dominance is something that has grown even in just the last two years. The, this movement of the uh, West being on the defensive by BRICS was gathering for decades, but it is accelerated enormously by the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, which I firmly believe was provoked by the United States. There's plenty of evidence for that. They wanted to do it to get Russia to uh, to be defeated and to bring down the government with sanctions and, and with an economic war, with an information war, 
and with the ground war, with the proxy war. They're losing on all three fronts. And Europe has suffered. And, and they're starting the realists now in Washington, in Brussels, in London, in a capital uh, here, even in The Hague, are starting to understand that they've lost this, this gamble. And Russia's not lost. And what has that done? That has increased this acceleration of an alternative economic tr trade diplomatic system that, that is now starting to trade without the US dollar, for example. So a whole other world system is developing. It was developing. It's been accelerated enormously by Ukraine. And I think that gave the courage now for somebody, and as well as the enormous crimes that Israel is committing now. They committed crimes with Castle, with all the other Gaza attacks. 2,000 died. This is so much greater in scale. This is obviously their attempt to finish off the project that Ben-Gurion began back in the 40s, which was to take all of historic Palestine. With genocide, with ethnic cleansing, they want River to the Sea. They are actually committing the genocide River to the Sea. To say that Palestinian protesters on American college campuses, when they say Palestine should be free, are the ones calling for genocide, when, the, when there's a real genocide going on, is so extraordinarily outrageous in projection and in muddling people's minds and in gaslighting everyone. So that's why I think South Africa could operate. It's not just them on their own. There's definitely in coordination with the other BRICS countries, including South, uh, Saudi Arabia, by the way, who's part of BRICS now. They are involved in this. So it's a great movement, and it is part of this totally changing world, as I was describing, this last case. And the International Court of Justice over there in The Hague, from where we are, is understanding that to a certain degree that they never did before. Dozens of countries are supporting uh, uh, South Africa, and there is lack of journalistic report being made of, of that case and others. But there, there is coverage, um, every day more so, even here on this small demonstration. And I'm not downplaying it, I'm just disappointed that not more people turn up especially since the Dutch should have a, a historic knowledge of, of the suffering that, that war brings. But there is coverage. I was um, at the first week of hearings of, of the Julian Assange case in 2020 just to see if Dutch journalists would show up there in front of uh, a Woolwich uh, a Crown Court. None were there. And now it's covered all over the place. We're being filmed by, by Holland's biggest Assange activist, <laughs> Jamila, who just delivered a speech on the, on the stage. Uh, brings me to you also with Consortium News. Maybe to close up with that, uh, I understand you got the Dutch instigated uh, Julian Assange Award and you're going to yeah, finally very, receive the thing. I'm happy about that and that's the reason why I'm here. Yeah. Um, just by coincidence, I'm, I'm in the head at the time of this court case. But I'm very, very pleased that I was, we were given that award. I think it's, uh, we have covered this case and our coverage may be the most comprehensive of any, certainly in the English language, because of the cowardice and the uh, laziness and the the malign behavior of the established media who exactly. have ignored this case, who hate Julian Assange basically, even though they recognize the danger to free press that this case brings, because this is an assault on the First Amendment, using the Espionage Act, which is clearly in violation of the First Amendment, it needs to be challenged, it's an unconstitutional law, it's still on the books, it does say anybody who possesses and transmits classified information without authorization could be charged. So Julian certainly was not authorized to have that. But he's, the First Amendment also says that you are protected. If you're not stealing those documents, you're protected and you could report this. And that's why the Obama administration did not uh, indict Julian Assange, even though they paneled the grand jury. Why the Vice President Joe Biden said we can't do it unless we prove he stole that thing. And now Trump indicted him and Biden is going along because of political reasons, because between 2010, which is what all the legal case is about, and now there was the DNC leaks, the Democratic Party leaks, and the CIA leaks. So the Democratic Party and the CIA are furious at Assange, and they'll never let Biden do it. So that is a problem, because that is not in the indictment, those two. They, he's not charged without those two leaks. It's only Afghanistan and Iraq war logs. So uh, it's, it's a, a damn shame the way the press has been covering that. And we, uh, have, we were there in Woolwich Crown Court. I was inside the courtroom that day. You say no Dutch journalists were there. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we have been in the forefront with other alternative media and covering this. It's fortunate we got the award, but we need to see the mainstream media, which knows their own uh, freedom could be at stake. They have to cover this case as this, and they might, when they, if he arrives in the U.S., we might see better 
coverage of the trial. And that could hurt Joe Biden very much, who's also damaged by Gaza, damaged by Ukraine. And now he could be damaged seriously if he brings a journalist in chains to the United States during his uh, presidential re-election campaign. That's why I think if it happens, it'll be after November, his extradition. That's my view. I couldn't think of a better winner. So good for you that you got that, uh, that uh, Julian Sars Award. Thank you for talking Thank to you. us. <laughs> Take care. Het gaat hier vandaag over saamhorigheid. Zonder hemel. Rustig liegt niet. Normaal maken is wat niet is normaal. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Decision to make. En dan ook geen hel meer. You think I'm joking? Predator drones. You will never see it coming. Laat staan dat ik kan ingaan over vuur. Bezig met vandaag.